The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. Welcome to the second lecture out of three, covering my orchestration of Faya's Andalusa. I thought that these lectures would be pretty useful because, in a way, I am detailing out all of the criteria that I'll be using to evaluate the entries that I'll be getting this year. When we left off last time in the piano score, the music was getting lower and lower and lower and getting softer. So right here at this bar, which I have given a rehearsal mark of C to, there's a bit of an expansion. And if you listen to most piano versions here, it's kind of an allargando. There's a stretching out of the tempo and definitely an expansion of scope in terms of the dynamics and the sense of grandiosity. And I wanted to capture that orchestrally. So that is part of the problem right in here. How do you make this gesture feel big and orchestral? And how should I convincingly transition from that into the next material? So that's problem number one. And of course, Within each basic problem, there are a number of tiny other little problems, like how to score this very evenly. Should I just score one line moving across the registers of the orchestra? And one answer to that question is given right here by the pedal. The way that a pianist would interpret it would be to leave down the pedal and let everything sustain through. Now, if there is going to be sustain, that means that the orchestra also needs to sustain these pitches as they move upwards. And how to do that convincingly can be tricky. If you have one instrument at a time playing notes in sequence, that can work. Sometimes it helps to have an instrument that runs across the top of that kind of a passage so that it really ties everything together rhythmically. You'll see what I did in a few minutes. Then we transition to this beautiful lyrical passage here. And there are a number of problems to address right in here. The first of which is how to deal with the accompaniment. Right here, we've got an instruction that this is going to be very, very expressive. And if you listen to the piano versions that I have linked in the events page, then you'll hear that there is a lot of play rhythmically and in terms of tempo. And so that is a level of rubato that you really cannot get with an orchestra 
unless you really practice the heck out of it and the musicians become accustomed to a certain push and pull within each bar. But since almost nobody has time to work on something like that to make it sound very piano soloistic, then we need to have an orchestral approach. So that is my first challenge right in here to myself, and that is to keep the pattern from being too regular and becoming too predictable. So it's just you know that really has that repetitive kind of mindless feeling to it as opposed to the beautiful expressive approach that you hear from the different pianists. So that might involve harp and if I do use the harp then I have to watch out about keeping the harp in the picture constantly because the harp will become less and less convincing as the music becomes much more aggressive and vivacious during these passages. Then there's the whole question of the melodic voice. This is where we get into issues of authenticity. I feel that if you're going to score something that fits the music without re-adapting it and re-synthesizing it and everything else, then you need to think about what Faya would have done if he were orchestrating it. So that's the next challenge, and that is to pick instruments to play this melody, and then when it picks up again, right here, for its second statement, that really have a ring of authenticity to them. So that was my next challenge on this page. And then right in here, there's a bit of a pulling back and you don't really see that in the music. You see that I've added right in here, poco rallentando and so on, this little dashed diminuendo, piano dolce, and that is really what most pianists do right in here. They ease off. And then here they push again. So we'll talk about that push in the next section of this lecture. But think about all of those things, okay? I'm going to play the score for you now. Consider all of those problems. A convincing Alargando expansion right in here, and a great transition or a smooth release, you might think of it, into the next bar. Keeping the accompaniment from being too predictable, from being too regular, from being too mechanical. If harp is going to be used, which I think you have a pretty good idea that I am going to use it, how do I use it in a way that doesn't really sound the same all the time, that doesn't become a crutch? And, of course, how do I score the melody in a way that feels true to Faya? Last, how do I manage this little restraint right in here? Because just... Throwing in a diminuendo may be enough to change the whole character, the whole scope of the texture of a passage when you are orchestrating. So think about all those things as you listen to it, and then I will meet you on the other side for the orchestrated answer to each problem. now for the orchestration. Let's start right with that first problem of orchestrating a convincing alargando here. Starting off from the very lowest note, notice that I've got double bass, tuba, and contrabassoon all united on that very low E. However, I've scored the tuba 
piano because I don't want the tuba sound to dominate right here. That is exactly what will happen if you score everything exactly the same dynamic. And you'll notice that though I have progressively louder dynamics across the strings and winds so that I compensate for when the new strings come in and making sure that they are as loud as the other instruments that are increasing in volume, I really ease back on my brass at first so that they really come in much more strongly at the end of the bar. And I give a little punch here with the timpani, but immediately back off to piano crescendo. Same exact principle. Now normally, I would just put an accent on a dotted half note and mark it forte piano, but I did a little bit of compromising in here because the Sibelius playback system does not really recognize what forte piano means predictably. Or maybe it does, but I'm just too lazy to go and tweak it. So starting off from the very low E, going to the next E, and then there is a D stacked up a seventh from that. So let's see how that was orchestrated. We see right in here cellos and violas forming that open seventh. And doubling them, we've got bass trombone here. The second trombone making an entrance right in here. And those two voices being doubled by Atu bassoons and bass clarinet on the upper D. Now remember, bass clarinet transposition down a major ninth, or an octave plus a major second. So E below, and then a whole step down from there to D, same as this D right in here in the violas, and of course this D in the trombones. Then we've got G sharp, B flat, and there's a repeat of the E down here, but there's really no point to repeat it. I don't feel that that really adds anything to my particular orchestration. It probably works pretty good with some others, but that's just not where I want it to go. So G sharp to B flat, and we're seeing that here. Non divisi, the violists are just going to add the G sharp to their tremolo. And then we have the B flat coming in here on second violin. Then above, first trombone coming in at around piano, mezzo piano, and then the second trumpet coming in on mezzo piano on the B flat. We got those same two notes here, of course, transposed for B flat clarinet, sounding G sharp and B flat. And then that B flat is doubled by the English horn, which sounds down a perfect fifth from where it's written, right? So that is actually sounding B flat. I kind of like this right in here, B flat to D slur, and that covers both of these notes, B flat and then D, and there's really no need for the third trumpet to hang on that B flat when it's got plenty of support from the first clarinet and the English horn. So there is our D, and then our diminished third here in the first violins sounds like a major second, but it's a diminished third. The other two trumpets coming in to double, and of course the oboes. So probably the instrument at the most disadvantage here will be the oboes. They'll be the most difficult to come through on this picture, even if the trumpets are holding back a little bit, which I intend them to. Right, They are going crescendo to forte, and our oboes and first violins are coming in at fortissimo, Notice the ferocity here, a fortissimo sforzando, right? So they'll really be digging in here. So I actually feel that the violins, even though technically they are the weakest group of instruments compared to the trumpets and the oboes, they'll still have the most ferocious sound right in here. And I have to say that I felt that the playback on this, which we'll review in a few minutes once I'm through describing everything on this screen, I feel like the playback does not really have the capacity to express what would really be going on there. It's a kind of a pale echo of how I'd conduct it if I could conduct, right? So 
just really pulling back at this and just hanging on this for a second and then going towards this accent. So it's not really something that Sibelius is set up for. I could probably do it with the DAW, kind of tweaking things, but I don't really have time for that. This is meant to be a fun challenge. I'm not preparing this for a client, right? I am preparing it for you guys so you can get a sense of how things work. But this isn't supposed to be a huge production. So that's my Alargondo expansion right in here. So a smooth release into this. I feel that if there is this big push right in here, then easing off, a bit of a sforzando in the winds, forte in the horns, and then diminuendo, and the same thing right in here, tremolo sforzando in our double basses and middle strings. I think that that is a really great way of taking the energy from this and then releasing it. The harmony will do that to a degree as well, because this is a 5-1 progression right in here. So it wants to rest on the 1, even if that 1 chord has a little bit of uncertainty to it in terms of this B-flat. All right, well, I promise not to get into the harmony too much. The harmony is actually really fascinating. But I'd really rather talk about the different problems and elements that I have to solve. The next problem from my list was keeping the accompaniment pattern from becoming too regular and too predictable. And that is really what made me sweat buckets right in here. Everything else was really, really basic. Hand in hand with that was keeping the harp from sounding too much the same and keeping it from staying in the picture constantly, sort of like a crutch. Let's talk about that harp first, actually. You'll see that it's playing similar pitches as to what is going on in my transcribed accompaniment. The clarinet's right in here, basically playing a similar pattern or the same notes as scored in the left hand here. And some of those notes being duplicated here, pizzicato cellos, and then this little offbeats in the viola. And this kind of playing for violists is fine. They will come in at the right time. I remember talking about the pitfalls of having really aggressive offbeats. It's a little bit easier to cope with, and especially since this is not the fastest part. Uh, the offbeat problem is really more pronounced at the beginning of section D, but we will talk about that in this lecture, I promise. So we've got some of the same motion right in here, the same exact pitches, and the violas and pizzicato cellos being doubled by the clarinets. And I feel that that has a beautiful, cool sound that allows the music to also relax from its previous tension and also change color from its previous brightness on the last screen. And of course, that is helped by the harmony that is playing behind it right here in the horns. And I feel that that pad brings a beautiful color into the music without being too obtrusive. Okay, so what does that have to do with the harp? That is going to lend some color to the harp. Just the way that this is scored with middle strings and clarinets and having horn behind them, there'll be a kind of a beautiful moonlit color to the music. And that will really help out the whole character of how the harp sounds right in here and will keep it from sounding too much the same when it re-enters right in here. Because here, the harp is not going to have very much doubling, if at all. So that is one way that I kept the harp from sounding too much the same. The other way was to just change octaves. So I've got that pattern right in here, and of course it is sounding up an octave already from where it's scored in the left hand on the piano and where that is transcribed for the orchestra. Were I to score the harp at the same exact octave as the clarinets and the cellos and violas, that would probably bury the harp. It would probably make it invisible. So 
I am bringing it up an octave and then an octave again to keep it from being too repetitive, dropping back down to follow the line of the melody and then jumping back up again, dropping down as the melody descends again and then ending with this nice roll. And that roll gives way to this wonderful and notice that even though there was a bit of a diminuendo indicated in the piano score, right? Diminuendo to piano. That is nothing that I have to follow. I would actually like this to be really aggressive and fun and bouncy and not get too soft. So I only go down to mezzo forte right in here. And the doubling of these elements is pretty basic. English horn doubling the violas the cello is going to arco and then grabbing the bottom notes of what the viola is playing and getting ready to basically play the same thing an octave lower. The cellos just have this wonderful bounce and push to them. Now notice the growing energy right in here. And I think tremolo works really, really well, just so long as you don't overdo it. In fact, catching a bit of the overtones of the horns right in here. Notice that this is a B flat fifth, right? It scored up a perfect fifth from where it sounds. I've got the overtones two octaves higher being underlined by the second violins in tremolo. So I felt that that was a really, really great way to bring out the moonlight. It works seamlessly with the harp jumping up into that same register. So as the harp jumps up, this little tremolo in the background emerges and then it stays. And notice that I changed the harmony right in here to a G fifth uh, following the change of harmony in the other parts. So you've got that same G fifth right in here built into the accompaniment. Another way that I kept the accompaniment from sounding too much the same, too regular, was to just simply use the trick of changing the register in the bass. So we've got the double basses jumping up and down and backwards, and it's basically playing the same notes that are being played at the bottom of this pattern. And adding some notes too that are actually not in the left hand from time to time. But all the same, just really having that sense of motion a little bit deviously. Things happening in the background that are a little suspicious. And we've got some basic doubling here, continuing on with Atu bassoons to follow the pizzicato. And notice that sometimes the doubling is on the cellos and then jumping downwards, doubling the double basses and then jumping upwards to grab the cellos again. So it really does kind of break things up and keep it from being too much the same. And I also get the increased scope. That's another problem I should have added to my list of things to tell you <laughs> that I was trying to solve. So that was just to keep everything from being in that really limited scope of one and a half octaves, two octaves above middle C or around middle C and upwards. So this definitely stretches things out, especially with that roving bass line covered by pizzicato double basses, a few notes here and there in the patterns, in the cellos, and all of that being doubled by bassoons, contra bassoon, and so on. And then that comes to an end, just as I described with that doubling. Notice I've thrown in just a little bit of tremolo to cover this note right in here in the treble clef of the piano. I feel that works really, really well. And then these chords right in here, chord, chord. It's a kind of funny because this is in bass clef and that's in treble clef, and it seems like the chords are going downwards visually, but just know that they are jumping up an octave. All right, so we have that same thing, jumping up an octave, starting off with a G sixth here, the B flat and an E, and then jumping up to the same thing, G sixth in the first violins with the B flat in the second violins. However, hanging on to this G sixth below <laughs> in the violas, 
pushing forwards and then hitting this nice and strong and then dying away very quickly. And we have the same harmony right in here, pushing in the horns on the same register as the first chord into the new harmony and then backing off immediately to triple P. Notice I don't bother using Niente. That really is more of a film score thing or a contemporary music thing where you really, really are trying to get people to hear how the music is fading away. I would say try not to use Niente too much in this kind of thing. This sort of concert music scoring, really. This is basically bringing a concert work to life and Niente is a bit cinematic and it's a bit modernistic. So maybe if we were orchestrating something by a composer from, say, the 1950s forwards, then Niente would be more of a thing. But I think in this particular context with such sort of obviously thematic, post-romantic kind of music, Niente is just really not needed. Notice the very easy way that the horns kind of disappear when the harmony changes right in here and they're replaced by clarinets and first bassoon on the bottom. And that's a good substitute or natural progression of color behind the tremolo that's happening in the strings. Now, continuing on with our theme of what is going on here with our harp. Now, the harp is continuing on with an adaptation of what's going on in this particular pattern and notice that the pattern is just really being given over to the harp at this point and that is because the theme is now in first flute and the texture is incredibly sparse here very very subtle it's very very much in the background and as far as keeping the accompaniment less predictable I've added some of these kind of propulsive pizzicato notes. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. And then, as things slow down a little bit, I have the double basses come in. Well, I want to keep this little two-bar section analysis for the very last thing that I talk about in this part of the lecture. But notice how the harp sort of jumps up an octave, jumps back down an octave, but pretty much follows what's going on in the piano, whether it is jumping up an octave or not. And then, of course, just with this beautiful cushion and the pacing from the double basses as doubled by contrabassoon staccato, and the chords jumping over from the horns to the winds, I feel that that's a really, really great background. So now let's talk about the melody. It's funny that melody is often what people want to jump to the first. And I think that sometimes it's good in a lecture like this to delay it until later. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So here I've used the first violins, and I feel that that is a really strong callback to how Fayo would use his first violins. If you look back at Knights in the Gardens of Spain and some of his other orchestral works, you'll see that he really uses the first violins as an expressive tool. He uses them as this wonderful singing voice when he's got a melody, especially one that is based on folk music, which I believe this really is the folk music of Andalusia. I think that this particular interpretation is something that he might have done to use the violins in a really expressive way and to give them some nuances that might not occur in the piano part. So right in here, just this push upwards, I think works really, really well. And the same thing right in here, this little bit, you know, da, 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 that really, really brings out a lot of juice into the melody. You cannot just trust 15 violin players to come up with a new way of interpreting your work, because if they all do something different, then that doesn't really help. So you really have to add nuances, and write out an expressive line with as much help as possible. And I would say that that's a good approach in any case, but especially 
when you have a mass group like this. 15 or 16 violin players and uh, you can't really trust them all to just make something up the way that you would have a soloist. So really add whatever expressive markings you think they need. Now don't overdo it, but just really make sure that they know what you want them to do. Okay, so we've discussed this little transition right in here in pretty good detail. And then the flute is coming in. It really has this wonderful quality to it. And I've added just a little ting right in here from Glockenspiel. And I feel that's a really great way of grabbing the energy that is coming up this way. Because it's going to die off pretty quickly. And I still want this A to come in nice and clear. So... I'm not adding the A's right in here to be sort of sweet and cute and tinkly. I am adding them to really just bring out this A in the flute. And then it continues on, sounding moon-soaked, as I intend. And solo flute is another really great resource for Faya. I feel that this also is pretty true. I could have also used oboe, but I'm intending to use it as a contrast instrument right in here. And I just feel that the flute works really, really well with the harp, as much of a cliche as you might feel that that is. I feel that it's just a really good resource of those two instruments working together. So we've discussed all of those things, keeping the melodic voice authentic to the composer, and how to keep the accompaniment from sounding too mechanical, and how to keep the harp interesting, and controlling this all Argondo expansion and everything else. So that just leaves this restraint right in here, managing how it works. So we've got this, bam, and then I have the echo in the first oboe, which, apologies, I forgot to write one period right in here to show that it was solo oboe. Da, 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 da. And right in here, you'll notice that I'm having these little offbeats returning that I had before in the violas. That is because the second violins and double basses are now working together to replicate some of this pattern right in here around the harp. So Adding that energy right in here as actually part of the restraint rather than part of something forceful. But it is a setup to increased motoristic energy that is going to fall on us in the next bar. So that is part of it. And you see the first violins taking that over right in here. Once again, double basses below. And they're actually playing fairly high, you probably noticed reaching all the way up to F and then E and so on. So I've thrown in a little harmonization right in here on the English horn, whereas we've got those same two basic notes, the E flat and the A right in here being played by the double basses pizzicato, of course, sounding down an octave. Same thing with the contrabassoon. And just really keeping the center of the sound picture from getting too cluttered is perfectly possible to drop things down by one or two octaves in a bass line like this when you're adapting piano music that is so really rigidly stuck in one area of the piano. It's perfectly fine to expand it out like that. And then we have that harmony pushing forwards and then bum, 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 ba -dum, is coming up with the trumpet. So that is going to be part of our Poco Animato, which we'll take a look at next time. But yeah, just really keeping this center kind of nice and harmonized, just kind of exploring the same basic harmony that is going on here, inherent in the accompaniment, with clarinets, bass clarinet, played fairly high, and bassoon in its tenor register, all kind of working together to keep things soft and in the background with just little touches of that kind of pulse that is coming back. 
I think that is one really great way to deal with setting up the next bar where things are going to get very fiery and tempestuous and then go into a very typical rubato for heavily characteristic music. So think about all those things. I'm not going to go over listing them all again, but think about how I handled that, how I dealt with the kind of mechanism of the accompaniment and tried to avoid sounding robotic and how I worked with the harp right in there and judge whether or not you feel that the melodic instruments were characteristic to Faya's music. And then we'll take a look at the next piece of piano writing and talk about some of the problems in that. C leading to D. And now we come to some really fun stuff in this score. As performed by most pianists, there is a bit of pushing into this fortissimo in terms of the tempo. Things tend to sort of speed up a little bit and then ease off right in here, which is why I added the rubato marking. That is all leading up to this moment of soloistic scoring. So by soloistic scoring, of course, this is a piano solo, so everything is soloistic. Except just that the melody itself stands out as a bit of a solo. So how do I interpret that, right? How do I take this burst of energy? As you'll recall, there was a bit of a relaxation, a bit of restraint coming into the music before, which... I pointed out could also be a thinning of the texture or as we saw in my orchestration kind of a submerging of the role of the accompaniment which just went to harp and a few little notes of emphasis in the strings plus some background pads. So now we're seeing things heat up and you'll see that I really spent a lot of time orchestrating these two bars to really make them come off well. To have this big burst of energy and this pushing of the tempo and then having it back off so that it prepares everything for this very soloistic moment. So how do I convey that sense of drama right in here? What instrument is going to work best in portraying this declamation and how am I going to accompany it from below what will be the most effective partner for this solo would the orchestra itself as a combined group work good or would a single instrument work better so those are also things I have to take into account then we've got the orchestra kind of coming back here a little bit the left hand becoming more complex, more involved as these chords descend and the music gets softer, leading to this agitato. So this, too, is a complex problem. How do we get from this bum -ba -dum, chord, ba -dum, chord, 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 and all of these little da-da-da, 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 kind of ideas. How does that all fit together orchestrally? And then our major pitfall right here. How do we interpret these broken octaves? <laughs> and I pointed out a bunch of problems overall. It's really impossible for lower wind instruments, brass instruments, string instruments, especially brass instruments, to play broken octaves at that speed. And it's also extremely unlikely for the principal player to hit the bottom note and the secondary player to hit the offbeat at that speed. 
you know, you have one player going dun 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 dun. You have the other player going dun 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 dun, and it's just really really hard to come in right on those alternating notes. So how do I solve that? How do I maintain the sense of jagged motion in there? The other thing that I noticed too was this little crescendo right in here, which is something that is not in the original piano score, but I put in because I'm noticing that most pianists do that as well. Whenever they have significant upward motion, they would tend to put in a little bit of a push. And then of course, these are in the piano score and are played beautifully by the pianist that you're going to hear on the recording I'm going to play in just a minute. So think about all those things as I play the piano part for you now. How to interpret this jagged kind of scoring. How to orchestrate this sudden flush of energy and speed right in here. How do I pull back into this rubato and strip out the elements so that we have a very declamatory solo instrument right in here? What is the accompaniment possible for that instrument? And then how do I add textural elements leading towards this kind of scoring right in here. Think about all those things and then I'll see you on the other side with the orchestral answer to those questions. And now <laughs> for that burst of energy. I think that the way to break this down that's the simplest is just to go for the most obvious elements first and then describe all of the stuff around them and the little subtle touches. So as you'll probably remember, before we had da -da 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 -um with the flute and then first oboe responding, with that same exact kind of idea. And then the trumpet coming in. So a much brighter, more insistent sound. And that is actually setting up the entrance of the solo right in here with the first trumpet and giving them a little bit of time to warm up. If you look at the piano part, it's really, really simple. We just have the pattern going on in the left hand and just a little bit of melody. And then right in here, things get a little bit more intense with harmonization in the right hand part and the left hand turning into this more aggressive pattern here that is more widely spaced across the piano keyboard. So how to interpret that? Well, first, we've got our basic idea, this moving bass line right in here, and that is being played by bassoons. A2, doubling the cellos right in here, Arco, and playing the sort of offbeats with that, the alternating notes, are our violins and a little bit of harp stuck in there. It, this won't be the most audible harp scoring, but it's still better to leave it in than to take it out. So we've got that same F sharp right in here that we're seeing in the second violins. And of course, the octave on top helps that note stand out. And then I've harmonized that with a basic D major triad, A on top, D on the bottom. And we're seeing some of those same elements here. We've got sounding F sharp in the English horn and in our horns. We've got a D major 6-3 chord, so sounding F sharp, sounding A, sounding D, which is going on an octave below. So the note that's being doubled is really just this one note right in here with the violas. And this is a really great way to bring in some life and some texture and some push. Now, <laughs> for the next little melodic phrase. 
Pardon my tuneless singing. So that's really simple. First violins, doubled by Atu flutes. Halfway through the bar, the second violins come in and continue on together as one united sound doubled by the oboes, Atu, and that is enough force. However, I am also making use of the first horn right in here, playing an octave below, adding the overtones, really strong octave overtones to the flutes and the second violins. And you probably have noticed that I have this approach to brass where I make use of their illusion of sounding an octave higher than they really are. And that's what I'm doing right in here. And I don't go all the way through with the octave doubling right in here. I just stop on this note. And then some of the other elements of accompaniment right in here are enough to help the horn presence come to a close. If you really look at the left hand of the pianist, we've got this big leap from this low E flat all the way up to this B flat in the treble clef and then some very emphatic accompaniment still in the treble clef before jumping back down to this low G. But there are also elements of harmony in the right hand, such as this B-flat and E-flat, and of course this harmonization right in here of the melody. So that is giving me some really, really great ideas about harmonizing within the string section. And notice that this B-flat fourth, taken from the piano part, really only lasts this long. This B-flat right in here is being played by both the violas and the cellos. Really, I felt that it was great for the cellos to do this big leap and land very firmly on that high note together. And we've got the same thing happening in bass clarinet and English horn, picking up where it can in doubling the cellos and bass clarinet. So it really hits this note firmly, which is something I think Faya really wants. And that strength helps to sort of lessen the impact of the first horn right in here, just kind of dropping off and giving way to the other horns playing part of the accompaniment. So what's left? to orchestrate in the accompaniment is just this bump up D-thirds, and that's easily done. English horn, bass clarinet, violas and cellos all doubling together. Notice that the cellos get the D and the violas get the F-sharp. And right in here, I've given the F-sharp to both English horn and bass clarinet, and given the D to the Atu bassoons. And that's a really good balance right in there. And I have the horns helping out right in here, but notice that they are starting an octave lower than the other instruments. So the other instruments are playing A in the treble staff, as we see here, but the horns are playing A an octave below there and then jumping up to that same D third. And I feel that that is a way of interpreting that wonderful burst of color and passion. And of course, you can see the other touches right in here, timpani, boom, boom, you know, really got my 5-1 right in there, uh, doubling what's going on here in the left hand, double bass, and timpani, unison, not at octaves, and of course, contrabassoon, grabbing those same notes, and gives it some emphasis on that downbeat right there. And it just very naturally drops off. But it um and bassoons and cellos doubling. And that's just a little bit of <laughs> staccato fermata. And that's more of a rhythmic thing than it is a exact duration. Right? So it's the rhythm of that particular slot in that bar 
is going to be a little bit longer. That's why I've added a tenuto mark here on the timpani stroke. But I still want my bassoons and cellos to be a staccato. Of course, double bass, tenuto mark, that's fine because I want the presence to match what's going on in the timpani. And here we have the solution to the next problem, which is the dramatic soloistic line right in here. I, of course, have not looked at anybody's entry yet, but I'm just wondering how many people chose to go bum 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 ba -dum on trumpet, because that is so fire. <laughs> and it is so much in the cultural character of this kind of music. Now notice the companion is just stripped down to nothing but bass clarinet. And I feel that this is just the perfect kind of direct and slightly creepy sort of companion for our trumpet. Boop, boop, beep, 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 boop, boop, boop. Dun, 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 right, so that all really works fine. Now, I'm going to show you something here by selecting all, and you'll see that I really, really tweaked the tempos right in here so that I would get something very similar to how the pianist played it in the playback. And you can see the tail end of the animato from the previous bar, this, this dashed line showing how the playback is tweaked to have the Acella Rondo last all the way into this beat. The trumpet continues on, forte, marcato, and that leads to our setup of the agitato section, which was another puzzle. How to do that in a way that really led from one section to the other. So we've got the melody continuing on, bam, bam softly the second time with some tambourine right in there. Notice that I have told my tambourine player where the fermata is so that they'll have their eyes on the conductor. I could have also had fermata on a 30 second rest and then had a 30 second rest afterwards. But anyhow, they'll get it. They'll understand and they'll actually get cued by the conductor. So We've got that little rustle right in there and then a softer one. So really, I feel that this is working hand in hand with the melody more than it is an element of accompaniment. There are actually two particular things going on in the accompaniment. We've got these chords sort of pushing into the music and then working their way down sort of portato, the way that they're scored in the piano part, ending with a accented staccato. And then, of course, this very agile jumping around right in here and these little beam groups that have a rest on the main beat. So how to interpret that? Well, pretty easy when you've got bassoons like this and you've got your cellos to divide up the duties thereby <clears throat> in a very simple way. And I feel that keeping it simple right in here is extremely important. So arco lower strings, and notice that I have given the bass player the option of playing the upper note rather than the lower note if they don't have a C bass or a C extension. And it's pretty much a transcription of what you're seeing here, except that the instruments go to octaves right in here, rather than playing unison as before. Starting off the same D, playing the same G, D in both parts in unison, and then going to unison octaves after that. And it's a good way to keep the music from getting so murky and so deep that you can't really hear it. And I've done the same exact thing right in here. Bassoons doubling the higher cellos and then having the contrabassoon just throw in a few lower notes to help clarify what's going on in the double basses. As to those chords, I've interpreted them not as staccatos but as tenutos. So tenuto and then a release. So I don't want this to be just a normal note. 
that leads to another normal note to another normal note. I want it to really last its full duration and then suddenly leave off just before the next beat. So same exact thing here, and it just really keeps it, you know, uh, uh, uh. It really has that kind of pulsing feeling without being connected. And that's just doubled by our horns. I feel that's a really, really good characteristic doubling for orchestrating Faya. That means that my music can be just as agile as it needs to be setting up this next section while still getting softer. Notice that I don't really follow the lead right in here of a diminuendo across four beats. I really just leave it where it is and allow the music descending and the elements telescoping to be enough of a diminuendo. You can work in diminuendos into your orchestral music when you've got many voices like this just by subtracting elements without having to necessarily throw in a hairpin. And that just takes us to the agitato. And I'm not going to say that I sweated buckets over this, that I really found it incredibly difficult to orchestrate. Because I didn't. I sort of saw it and I thought, I know what needs to happen here. But I did do a little bit of consulting with a bassoonist friend of mine to really make sure that I could get some kind of fast single tonguing in here across the bassoons. So their advice was, don't really go more than five or six in a row. So you can do single tonguing actually for quite a long time on bassoon and oboe, but it really does wear out the player. So this kind of overlapping, trading off scoring is probably ideal. And I'm once again real curious to see how other people orchestrated this, how they solved that problem. Now, obviously, I can't really get the entire broken octave effect, but check out this idea. We've got basses playing an octave lower than cellos, and we've got the cellos playing doubled pitches, and we've got the basses not, right? And then we have the same idea here. Contrabassoon on the bottom there, trading off with tuba, and it's the bass trombone that plays the double tonguing right in here. And notice that I've left the double tonguing for being in the staff. I think it's kind of hard on a bass trombonist to really have beautifully accurate, nicely controlled double tonguing below the staff. And I'm sure that there are bass trombonists out there who will say, oh, no, it's totally simple. It's easy for me. And then there will be others who say, oh, man, I don't want any of that at all. Leave it to a tenor trombone player. Why didn't you have, like, the second trombone come in there and play the F and so on? But I just feel it's a much better partnership between the bass trombone and the tuba rather than second trombone and tuba. I think that this works a whole lot better just in terms of the players sitting next to each other. And I've seen this kind of scoring in Schoenberg and, and other kinds of things where there's double-tonguing in low trombone parts, and in fact, in most commonly in muted trombone parts. So anyhow, I feel that this isn't too much of an ask. And then right in here, we've got our tenor trombone taking over, taking it higher. And I have kept my dashed hairpins and just made them normal old hairpins. Notice the dynamic balance in here. It's all pretty much marked the same. Pianissimo in all the instruments, and that's a better approach to take unless you have some very, very fine textures. You don't really need to mark your brass section down to triple P to get a good balance unless your texture is very exquisite and carefully controlled. And now, just to add a little bit of oomph, occasionally, I've thrown in a bass drum strike. So, mezzo forte against the opening forte notes, and then after the pianissimo, just a piano stroke there, another one there. 
notice another thing is I only bring in the heavy brass when there is a dynamic swell. So otherwise I just leave it to the lower strings and the bassoon family. But then there's this little push, so I throw in this lower brass. Another push, throw in more brass. And then the third and final push, really with the same kind of strategy. Except I really just give it over to the bass trombone when I get to this point. So I feel that that is one way to deal with these broken octaves and still have the same kind of energy rather than just going bum 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 and so on. For me it's better to do that, but who knows what Fio would have decided to do. I also made an effort to maintain the register of this particular passage right where it was written because I feel that that is an effective, interesting place for the orchestra to go to really give the lowest instruments a chance to work out and show why they are some of the best players in the orchestra. So that is my interpretation of the middle of this piece and coming up in our third and final lecture the sort of hallucinatory surrealistic tutti of the rest of Rehearsal D and then the sudden little burst of nimble energy that follows that, that relaxes into a beautiful solo section. And then, of course, there's a final moment of uncertainty ending in a very blissful faraway chord. All of those sections have their own orchestration problems and proportional problems, not just technical ones or coloristic ones, but making sure that certain sections lead from one into the other in a way that feels extremely natural. That, I think, was the toughest problem of all for me to solve. But without going into too much detail, I hope with this orchestration that I've solved that problem at every transition. You be the judge. Let me play it for you now, and I will see you very soon for the last part of this little lecture series. <laughs>